Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Uh, it's good to be with you again. Thanks for, for joining us for our pre press conference to give you an update on Delaware's response to COVID-19. We did these press conferences on a weekly basis for, gosh, the better part of a, a year. And as things got better in the summertime, we decided uh, to lay off them for a while and, and just to continue to encourage people to get vaccinated and get information out in a different way. We did want to as we're seeing a, a, a surge in the increased number of positive cases associated with uh, the holidays and the winter months and people coming back in, indoors. And just to show you where we are today, give you some update on the data so everyone has an understanding of that. Talk a little bit about the, the Delta variant, which is really driving this current surge. And again, the move indoors by folks. We're joined as we normally would be with our, our press conference with Dr. Rattay, Carol Rattay, who's the director of the Division of Public Health. Thank you, Dr. Rattay. I don't know that you ever imagined that you'd have to do something like this uh, when you decided to, to, to seek a career in, in public health, but uh, you've been a great leader in the division there, and I know your people continue to work hard. Uh, A.J. Shaw, the director of the Delaware Emergency Management Agency, who's shouldered so many responsibilities uh, across the board and is our point person on emergency response, vaccinations, testing, and, and the like, again, with a, a great uh, great team of folks uh, backing them up. And in particular, special notice to uh, the pharmacies and the hospitals who continue to come up big, particularly the pharmacies with their vaccination efforts. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, Pam is with us again as well, our, our sign language expert for the deaf and, and hard of hearing. We're going to start out as we normally do by reviewing the data. I do want to kind of go over the, that data to just show you where we've been. You can see, you'll see as we look at the hospitalization numbers, here's the data update on the board. Uh, we've, we're up now on a seven day moving average. That number of positive cases jumps up and down, mostly up uh, in recent days, uh, but now it's approaching 600 to give you some idea when we stopped doing our press conferences in late summer, we were in the 20s in terms of new positive cases on a seven moving day average. So a significant uptick. It started to increase uh, really after Labor Day uh, in early September. And we were in the 350 to 400 range and continue to tick up from there. Percent positives, if you'll remember, we're always looking for the, our goal of being under the World Health Organization target of 5%, we're up at 8.7%. And uh, part of that is the fact that there's less testing going on. And we'll see that from AJ's presentation a little bit later. And so if you have fewer tests, you're gonna have a lower denominator to bring back your memories of fractions in, in middle school. And so that number is gonna go up. Uh, but obviously, uh, you combine it with the uptick in positive cases, and there you have it, 8.7%, almost twice what our target is at 5%. Like I said, we were in the 1% to 2% uh, range back in the summertime when we hit our summer low. The one number that I uh, increasingly mentioned and we track very vigorously is the hospitalization number for lots of different reasons. Number one, we know it's not a function of testing rates because these are individuals who have been tested, they're in the hospitals, they're under critical care, which is why they're in the hospitals or they're under hospital care. We have 34 uh, of those 296 are, that are critical condition. Uh, this peak, and we'll see that in a minute, we're gonna show the roller coaster back in, in uh, January of, of last year, we hit a peak of 474. But there's a big difference between the 296 today and the 474, and that is that back then we had fewer people in the hospitals because the hospitals were managing their in-hospital census by curtailing voluntary surgeries and, and other purposes. We were had lots of sectors of our economy closed down, and so there was less travel on the roads, less injuries fewer people going into the hospital. And so at 296, it's probably much tighter for hospital capacity. And AJ will show you some of those numbers a little bit later 
than it was uh, back in January at 476. And so that's an important thing to think about. We went off the day, you can see the roller coaster ride. It started again as the holiday season of last year of 2020 after Thanksgiving and the run up to the peak there in early January after the December holidays. And then as we improved through January and February, we started vaccinating uh, Delawareans. And so a very different circumstance with that peak in uh, January a year ago than what we're seeing now. We had a little uptick in April. And then of course the weather, the summer months came and we hit lows over the summer where we're in the twenties in terms of of uh, positive cases and very low numbers uh, in terms of hospitalizations. And then we had a run up which started a little bit late summer into uh, Labor Day and then Halloween. Uh, we peaked again in, in September there and with a little bit of, of a down tick. And now after Thanksgiving, as we started to move into the December holidays, people moving back indoors, it's cold outside, people are circulating, a lot of people vaccinated, but taking, uh, not taking the precautions that they were before because they are vaccinated and, and there is a greater comfort level there, uh, but we need to stamp down the surge that we're seeing, keep our families safe. Uh, let's look at the fact vaccine update. You can see we've delivered almost 1.5 million vaccines and that's really a tremendous thing by all the public agencies, our pharmacies, our hospitals who've administered those vaccines. We've got uh, almost 62% uh, of Delawareans fully vaccinated and, and moving up at 602,000 uh, fully vaccinated Delawareans. You'll know that our, our total population is about uh, 950,000 closing in on a million people. So you can do your math there. Here's the breakdown under that, uh, the, the percentage of Delawareans five years and older, 20, 12 years and older, 18 and older, and 60, 65 and older who are fully vaccinated. So two, uh, at least uh, two shots. We'll talk about the boosters in a minute. But those, uh, those vaccination rates are not even among various age groups. And you can see here with this chart, fully vaccinated rates by age group, that young adults 18 to 34 are really kind of under vaccinated at rates, just above 50% or lower than 50%, particularly in Kent and Sussex County. Some of the racial and ethnic uh, subgroups there, even lower vaccination rates. And so in these subgroups, uh, you're, with the lower vaccination rates, you're going to see a greater risk of spread of the virus. And that's what we're seeing, as Dr. Rattay will report to. Those of us who are 65 and old, older, we understand the risk. <laughs> we want to live longer. We want to protect uh, our families and people that we come in contact with. And the vaccination rates are extremely high. Here we go, have fully vaccinated rates over 90%. Uh, and uh, leading the leading county there over 65 is 95 percent at down in in Sussex County. Many uh, subgroups are eligible to be vaccinated or to be boosted uh, and recommended by the CDC and our public health professionals. We're not doing as well with uh, with boosters. I got my booster a couple weeks ago to to demonstrate that this is a good think for all of us to do. It'll give you extra protection. We have some data that demonstrates that with respect to the new cases and hospitalizations that we're seeing there. So here are the percentage of the population that have received their boosters, again, 65 and older, about, about half at 50%. Need to move those numbers up, not as high for others that are eligible, 18 and over and 15 and over, but you see uh, the percentages there. What it really boils down to as we move into the holiday seasons now, wear a mask. Wear a mask when you're indoors. Wear a mask. We're strongly advising when you're indoors and in crowded spaces to wear a mask. Obviously, can't wear a mask when you're eating in a restaurant, but wear a mask when you're not. Make sure that you're wearing masks if you're in 
Obviously, if you're in schools and public places, public buildings, you're required to wear a mask or children in schools are required to wear a mask. And we see very little spread there in schools uh, because of the of mask wearing. But now as we think about what we can do and think about the effects, right? Our hospital uh, workers, our nurses, our first responders have really been stressed over the last almost two years now, 20, 20 months with uh, the treatment of patients with COVID-19, our emergency rooms have been full, our hospitals uh, are treating these patients. We've seen uh, over a couple thousand Delawareans who've passed away from COVID-19. We all know about it, somebody like that, and they're not just all very old seniors. We just had a really well-known and well-respected state employee, just a tremendous state employee passed away, very healthy guy and just so sad for his family and for all of us that I know all of you have the same, have experienced the same. So there's some easy things that we can do. Just be conscious of the fact that there's a lot more a spread in the community. Wear a mask when you're indoors, get vaccinated and get boosted. We're going to all going to be uh, better off if everybody gets their vaccination. We have vaccinate, high vaccination rates that served us well. We need to get more people to get those shots. Get your second shots if you've only had your first. Pharmacies is the best place now. Everybody has adequate supply. Sometimes you've got to get an appointment to get your, your vaccination or your booster. But if you're, and a lot of people haven't received their booster, go now's the time to do it. As we move into the holidays where we're going to be closer at getting together as families with our holiday celebrations, our holiday meals, our holiday parties, wear masks when you're indoors, uh, get vaccinated, and get boosted. Um, and again, the best place to do that is at your local pharmacy. We do have Del a Delaware Division of Public Health clinics that are doing it as well. And we would recommend that you contact one of those in your neighborhood if that works best for you. Uh, Dr. Karawate, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our director of the Division of Public Health and the leader of our public health team is with us again today, and she's going to drill down a little bit into to these numbers, give some some uh, advice, and some add some some science to to the presentation of the data that I've just made, and and to to reinforce the recommendations that we're bringing to all of you this afternoon, Dr. Rote. Thank you so much, Governor. So as you mentioned, our case rates and our percent positivity as well as hospitalizations have increased in Delaware. Now we are, um, this is a Delta surge. So um, the majority of the cases that we, we see that we sequence are Delta. So um, we are still dealing with this contagious Delta variant. Um, and in fact, we saw a nearly 50% increase in cases in uh, in the last week. Uh, it, interestingly, for a change, um, the age group that had the highest case rates was the 35 to 49 year olds. Um, for the last few months, the highest case rates have been among school age population, five to 17. Prior to that, it's it's been the young adults for a while. Uh, but statewide, as well as in Sussex, it's the 35 to 49 year olds who have the the highest case rates, but but really we're seeing high cases uh, throughout the state. In fact, you know I normally start with an area of concern map where um, we use uh, the same criteria um, most of the past uh, 20 months, looking at um, zip codes with higher than 250 cases per 100,000 people, um, a high um, uh, person positivity rate of 15. And when we use that now, we see almost all of Delaware lit up and meeting that criteria with the exception of Greenville and Bethany Beach. So I'm gonna show you a slightly different picture today, adding an additional filter onto that, looking at the zip codes uh, that not only fit the, those areas of concern criteria that I just mentioned, but also the areas that have a test-based positivity rate that is higher than 10. And this would indicate that these are areas not only with higher infection, but also lower testing. And so that's the map that you see on the left. If you look at the map on the right, 
you see the zip codes that we're considering the zip codes with the lowest vaccination rates. That means they're 10 percentage points lower than the state average uh, for fully vaccinated persons. And you can see uh, for the most part, uh, most all of those low vaccinated zip codes are the same zip codes uh, that uh, meet that criteria for areas of concern plus high test positivity. And re so really what this is, you know, showing us is if we increase vaccination in these areas, we can naturally expect infection rates to go down as well. I know all of these numbers are discouraging to, to folks, and this is not where we want to be with, with case numbers at the same level as they were last year. But here's something important. On the next slide, I want to talk about um, um, cases by vaccination status. Uh, now, we've sadly hit a milestone number for deaths today with the death um, death number surpassing 2,200. Um, and, but our death rate has decreased significantly. So the death rate is much lower than it was at this time last year. So 80% of the deaths are among individuals who are not vaccinated. Um, additionally, 80% of the hospitalizations are among those not vaccinated. And again, most of the cases are among those who are not vaccinated. So this Delta surge is being uh, driven uh, by individuals who are unvaccinated because again, uh, the, the vast majority of, of Delawareans are um, vaccinated, as the governor said, it's it's almost 62% are fully vaccinated. Uh, so that smaller percent uh, that's not vaccinated um, is driving cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, which means that the vaccination, the vaccine does work, um, but we can do something about these numbers. For people who are not vaccinated, they can get vaccinated. For people who are still partial, partially vaccinated, they can get their second dose, and people who are eligible can get their booster. Our highest priority needs to be to get people who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated protected with the vaccine as soon as possible. So let me shift a little to um, talk about our pediatric situation. On this slide, you can see the case rates among our children ages five to 17 over the past few months. In September, we saw a peak among this, this age group where we hit a weekly total of about 1,000 cases for, for three weeks in a row. Um, then the cases began to decrease. However, uh, by late October, cases began to increase again significantly. We've seen about 4,000 pediatric cases since then. And really in total, since this Delta surge began um, late June, uh, there's been a total of around 14,000 uh, pediatric cases. Now, since early August, the 5 to 11 age group has the highest case rates, which is really not surprising since they've only recently had access to the vaccine. However, the 12 to 17 year old age group has been in a close second place during this, this time period. Um, just one minor point I want to point out is that it, uh, the last week shown on this graph, um, which is November 30th through December 3rd, is an incomplete week. Uh, nonetheless, it still has a higher uh, case. It shows higher childhood case rates than the full week of November 23rd, which again is indicating an increasing trend. I also want to mention hospitalizations. Uh, hus our hospitalization number uh, for children and youth was highest in September at 53, and it decreased since that time. But unfortunately, with only three days of data in December, there have already been nine pediatric hospitalizations, which indicates that um, we will likely see a dramatic increase this month if the trend continues. Now, people are constantly asking why we care so much about vaccinating the younger children, and here is why. We know that they have lower rates of death and hospitalization compared to adults, but children can experience severe illness from COVID-19 and can be hospitalized and die. And they also can suffer long-term symptoms of COVID. So if you can avoid this infection for anyone, including children, you should. And we must do all we can to protect our kids. And that includes encouraging parents to get them vaccinated.
So let's talk a little bit about pediatric vaccinations. All kids over the age of five now are eligible for the Pfizer vaccine. It was an exciting day, November 3rd, uh, when the Pfizer vaccine was authorized for kids five to 11. Um, it's a one third of the uh, adult dose size and it's widely available. And it has been now since November 3rd. But our biggest concern really is uh, low vaccination rates among this age group as well as um, the adolescent group. So among uh, that adolescent group, the 12 to 17 year old population, uh, most, uh, well, they've all had access to the vaccine since May. Some, in fact, the older kids have had access since March. We only have 51% of this age group is fully vaccinated. Uh, meaning many adolescents are still vulnerable to this infection. And after more than a month of access, we have approximately 16% of our five to 11 year olds who are vaccinated. And in fact, this makes Delaware in the lower half of states in terms of vaccination rates for the five to 11 age group. And in general, we tend to do really well for pediatric vaccinations. So this is a real disappointment to us. Uh, we know that parents have concerns. We're working to address them by distributing educational flyers and other materials, um, such as those on the right hand side of the slide to let parents know that this vaccine is safe. Clinical trials found it to be more than 90% protective in this younger age group against the virus. There's no lasting side effects. And since the vaccine was authorized almost five million children in this age group have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine and there have been no serious side effects like myocarditis identified. The vaccine will not impact fertility among children and children who are fully vaccinated do not have to quarantine after uh, they're exposed to someone when they're considered a close contact of someone who is who tests positive for COVID-19. And that's a real help to parents, kids, and schools. It, it minimizes disruption to school and to learning. We're working with schools and parent and sports organizations statewide to get this information out there. And parents are encouraged to visit our webpage on the coronavirus site for more information and to talk to their child's pediatrician if they have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. So let's switch topics to another hot topic right now, which is the Omicron variant. Omicron variant is um, on many people's minds right now. Uh, the presence of this variant was first reported in South Africa, and now there are cases reported in the U.S., including in surrounding states like Pennsylvania and Maryland and New Jersey. Uh, there are no cases in Delaware as of today, but it is really only a matter of time. Our public health lab is sequencing for the presence of the variant as are some commercial labs. So we have been looking uh, since uh, we learned about the Omicron variant uh, for it. And uh, certainly we will keep doing that. In fact, our team went backwards a month to look at some of the positive uh, test results to uh, make sure that we, we did not see it. And at this point, we have not found it. Uh, again, we just, we wanna stress this is not a time to panic. There's a lot we don't know yet about this particular variant, like how transmissible it is. Early indications are that it moves quickly, but we just don't know for sure. Is it more infectious than Delta? Does it cause more severe disease? Right now, a lot of reports are of mild disease and hospitalizations that are mostly among the unprotected or unvaccinated. But again, we just don't know for sure yet. And how well do the vaccines work against the Omicron variant? It will take another week or so for us to get a clear picture. But like other variants, it's likely that the existing vaccines will provide some level of protection, especially against more severe cases. So let's do what we know we can do and what works. So none of this is rocket science, but it is time for us to double down. If you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, now is a critical time to do it. If you have been putting off your second dose, schedule a time to get it now. And if you are eligible for a booster dose of the vaccine, please get one. I'll talk more in a minute about what we know about boosters. 
wearing a mask when in indoor public settings is really important. Now that we're dealing with this uh, new Delta surge, I can't say this enough, going into the grocery store, going gift shopping, going to the craft, share, craft fair, sporting event, concert, holiday gathering. If you're indoors, please wear a mask and socially distance from others when you can. We know space equals protection. Getting tested regularly, weekly, if you are unvaccinated, is really important for identifying infection and, and reducing spread. And if you have any symptoms or have been exposed, uh, please uh, get tested. And stay home if you have any symptoms of COVID. We, we're continuously seeing individuals who have symptoms of, of COVID and continuing to go out there and exposing other individuals. So you know, if you have any of those COVID symptoms, uh, please stay home, please get tested. We are seeing influenza now, it is, it is active, and we just can't afford the strain on our healthcare system to add um, a bigger winter COVID surge in addition to the influenza that we're expecting to see increase. So uh, please do all the things that we know stop the spread of infection now to, um, uh, to help. So finally, let's talk about boosters. Just two weeks ago, the FDA and the CDC authorized the booster doses for those who are 18 and older. And studies show that these boosters offer great immune protection against COVID. Since the boosters were initially authorized, nearly 160,000 Delawareans have received one. And with the presence of the Delta variant and rising case numbers, we need more people to get one. Boosters increase the strength of your antibody response to protect you from the virus and its many mutations. And as I mentioned earlier, vaccines are effective against hospitalization and death as evidenced by the fact that deaths remain low and that most cases, hospitalizations and deaths are among those who are unvaccinated. But immunity against just getting the virus itself does wane over time. We wanna cut down the opportunity for you to get the virus in the first place. So if you're 18 or older, and it's been six months since you were fully vaccinated with Pfizer or Moderna, or if it's been six, sorry, or if it's been two months since you received the J&J &J vaccine, get your booster shot as soon as possible. We're working on a mini campaign at the state level to promote boosters. And last week, President Biden announced a national campaign that is forthcoming. But if you have questions and want more information, visit de.gov slash boosters on our website. And now back to you, Governor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rate. Thank you for sharing all that information, and, uh, putting out there the uh, concerns about the Omicron uh, variant, which hasn't derived in Delaware. At least we haven't detected it yet. It has been. Uh, detected in, uh, in other states. This surge that we're experiencing, as you've said, is is the Delta variant, and we need folks to uh, to mask up uh, when indoors, to be careful with respect to social distancing, and most importantly, to get vaccinated and get boosted. Uh, AJ Shaw is with us again today. AJ, I know you've got some important information to share, particularly to put into some context the hospitalization uh, numbers. It's one of our biggest concerns, obviously. We've heard from our partners at the hospitals, the stress that their people are under, number one, uh, and they're having trouble keeping, you know, staff on board as a, a result of that in part, and the, the higher numbers that uh, now their, their hospitals uh, have more patients in it for other purposes, and so the surge in, in COVID-19 doesn't help. Uh, AJ, give us an update. Uh, thank you, sir, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, kind of to add on to what the governor was just saying, we are seeing increased rise in hospitalization. So we were, uh, you know, two, 290s coming on 300, very close to what we saw about this time last year prior to vaccinations. And we have two slides here to kind of compare where we were. So this was uh, last year between, I believe, October 1st and the end of uh, December. And if you see that blue and then that orange uh, part of the, the graph, that was either uh, positive COVID patients are those people that are still waiting for their test results that were in the hospital. And it's about 20% of those that were in the hospital last year at this time were um, 
COVID patients. Uh, and if you looked at those that were admitted, so not necessarily in the emergency department, but those that were admitted for overnight stays or longer stays, uh, you know, we were just about under, just under 1,600 individuals across the um, state in the hospitals. And then if you go to the next slide, this is uh, really October 1st through uh, yesterday, and you'll see the COVID patients is a much smaller portion of um, those that are in the hospitals. It's about, it's almost the same number, 296 versus 313, so off by less than 20 compared to the same date last year. However, it's only about 16 to 17 percent of the overall capacity of the hospitals. And like the governor said and Dr. Rote said, you know, there was a lot of delayed care during COVID. There's people that are going back for, uh, you know, procedures, um, healthcare issues that, you know, may, were probably compounded by the uh, the, the pandemic. And so it, it's a strain. So the 454 number that we saw as being, hey, we were able to handle this. The hospitals did an amazing job making sure they can navigate uh, the patients when we were at, you know, mid 400s. That's going to have a much higher strain today on the hospitals than it did earlier this year. And that's what we need to look at. That's what we're worried about. It's not a bad issue. It's not the actual square footage issue. It's, it's really a staffing issue when we talk to our hospitals. Um, you know, you have a, a, a overworked uh, labor pool. You, you have a, a lot of uh, turnover in, in some of the facilities because of the stress they put them under. But those there are doing a tremendous amount of job, uh, a tremendous job to make sure that they're caring for everybody. We want to do what we can to lower that risk and trying to keep some of these people out of the hospital. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, watch very closely. We're working on a few other programs to kind of see what we could do to help uh, relax some of this pressure off the hospitals. But the number one thing we could do right now is keep individuals that can get vaccinated, can protect themselves, can protect the healthcare system to do that. So that's uh, kind of the, the reoccurring message we have of, of today. So uh, after that, gonna go into a little bit of a testing update. Um, you know, here we have a graph that is, or just some numbers that go through the number of tests we've done for a week. As you see, for the beginning of November, on the, the number um, has decreased a little bit, um, you know, to we were in the mid 30s, then we a little bit before Thanksgiving went down to the 20,000s, and then we, we inched back up a little bit last week to the 14,000. To put that in comparison of last year, we did about 45,000 tests a week between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we're doing a fraction of the tests we were last year. Yes, there's uh, a lot of large proportion of our um, populations that are vaccinated. However, there's a large portion that isn't that we uh, that should be getting tested regularly, and uh, especially if they have symptoms or they've been traveling or something else. So the capacity is out there. We have uh, the same number of sites and actually added a few more than last year. So uh, make a reservation, walk up. Uh, you know, th there are facilities across the state. Go to de.gov slash get tested. That is updated uh, either Sunday or Monday of each week to show uh, the rotating locations we have, as well as the static locations. Um, as well, I just do want to take a, a minute to plug on the last slide here. Uh, you know, we do have some rapid testing available. It's it's in high demand at three sites. Uh, the Oxford uh, the University Plaza Health Clinic in uh, Newark, Blue Hen Corporate Center down in uh, Dover, and then the Georgetown Plaza. So these are uh, three standalone facilities that uh, Dr. Tate's team stand opened up, I guess, uh, earlier this year. They've been uh, worked with by the Guard, Public Health, and our partners at Curative. They'll do testing there. They'll also do vaccinations. They'll do vaccinations whether you need your first dose, your second dose, a booster, five to 11s if you need uh, that Pfizer or the other one. So it's kind of your, your one-stop shop. Um, you know, try and make an appointment for the rapid testing because there's a time that goes into that. So, that, you know, sometimes later in the day, they're unable to... Uh, give everybody a rapid test, but they could still get the PCR. And the turnaround time uh, with curative has still been in that 24 hour mark. So it's been very uh, quick and successful. So uh, a lot of options out there for both vaccinations and testing. If you go to the, uh, you know, the, the coronavirus uh, website, you, you can navigate that. Pharmacies like the governor said and Dr. Tay said are still doing a large number of the uh, vac vaccinations, but we also have the uh, public health clinics there to support and uh, support people as well. So with that, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, AJ, and uh, thank you to Dr. Rattay. I do want to put up one of the uh, the graph that we had earlier that shows uh, the roller coaster ride that we've been on uh, since uh, March of, uh, of 2020. And uh, I do want to um, 
Talk, just mentioned that uh, where we were last year, we were at uh, uh, this time last year, December 7th of last year in hospitalizations, we were at 338. And today we're at uh, 296. So we're not uh, as high as we were a year ago, but you can see uh, that uh, we've had a surge that started a little bit earlier this year in the winter. Uh, they kind of declined a little bit and now is on the uptick. So the perp really the the main message today is that we've got to get more people vaccinated to prevent the continued surging of, of the Delta variant of COVID-19, anticipating that uh, the, the Omicron variant uh, will arrive in Delaware at some point. We know we're just on the front end of the December holidays, lots of uh, parties, lots of celebrations coming up. We want folks to think about uh, helping us to to protect our hospital capacity, to protect uh, all those uh, frontline nursing and hospital staff workers that uh, have to deal with folks that uh, end up in the hospital to prevent uh, the deaths that that occur to uh, too many Delawareans. And so that's the message today. You can help wear a mask, get vaccinated, get your booster, uh, keep your distance indoors with with other folks around, uh, observe social distancing, be responsible. We've we've made it this far. Uh, we've ro ro we've ridden this uh, roller coaster here. Uh, we rode it up uh, last year. At this uh, this time, uh, we're on the front end of it. Let's uh, get ahead of it as we move into the latter part of December. So with that, you now we have members of the media who have joined us. We appreciate your reporting over the last uh, 20 months and your presence with us today and look forward to your questions. All right, the first question will be from Meredith Newman from the News Journal. Meredith, just give me one second. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Governor, you are encouraging people to wear a mask indoors. Why not just mandate it knowing what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks with holiday celebrations? Well, I think uh, obviously, as I've been saying for some time, uh, it's the best way to do this is uh, is to encourage people to, to take the protective measures. Uh, sometimes you get more pushback by mandates. Uh, there are still limitations to, to what, what uh, we can do. On the, under the current uh, limited uh, state of emergency declaration. So we're just encouraging folks. We like to to avoid mandates uh, like that. And uh, the places that, that, that I go to, I often see most people wear a mask when other people wear a mask, oddly, and uh, low uh, adherence to, to mask wearing when, uh, when others aren't wearing masks. So I think if we can get the message out that we're we're going to see this this winter surge as we have in the past. Uh, that will pe people will will help out and 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 don their mask and and help us to prevent the surge from from getting out of control. And you mentioned workforce issues within hospital and healthcare settings. I'm curious how workforce issues might be affecting um, vaccine rollouts or even testing capacity. Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Retain, AJ, to, to comment on that. I don't know that we've seen that. I will say that we have workforce issues across the economy. Uh, it's certainly acute uh, in healthcare and long-term care facilities. We've provided additional resources as incentives to attract those workers. We know that they're traveling nurses that are moving around and, and filling in and getting paid uh, a lot of those uh, bonuses. And but it's not just in the healthcare, uh, long-term care sector. It's just about its hospitality. You name it. It's construction. Uh, it's across the economy where the biggest challenge is finding workers. I think the August numbers, uh, uh, national numbers, there were 10 million job openings and 8.6 million people looking for work. And so every industry is experiencing some of that. Dr. Rattay, AJ, on the testing side. I can speak on the vaccination side um, the best where, um, you know, we have seen pharmacies um, struggling with um, their workforce. We have seen pharmacies decreasing 
their hours of availability. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't have access to the vaccine, but they have needed to shorten some of their hours and some of their um, um, amount of time that they're accessible for vaccine. Um, however, they still are doing the vast majority of vaccinations in our state, and we're rarely hearing about people who can't get the vaccine at a pharmacy, um, but it, it's possible that it may take a couple of days before you can get scheduled. We're very fortunate that we still have the National Guard helping us out. They've done just an amazing job in our vaccine clinics. Um, the kids love them. Um, they, they really do a fabulous job. And so um, for our uh, public health workforce, we've been able to meet the needs in our clinics uh, with the help of the National Guard. And that's for vaccine and testing. And AJ? Yeah, so the only thing I'll add, I mean, Dr. Tay hit the National Guard point. They, they have been a great backstop and, uh, you know, force multiplier. Um, our partner, Curative, has, you know, I'll tell you, there, there have been a few speed bumps in the road, and it hasn't been because of labor. It's usually been, uh, you know, vehicle issues, trailer issues, stuff like that, where we've had to, uh, you know, uh, juggle a few too many balls in the air. But uh, when it comes to um, the workforce, they've done a great job of uh, keeping it at a level to serve the state well. Um, and also they brought additional people on when we started doing rapid testing in a few sites as well to make sure we weren't taking from another effort and uh, really, you know, increase the, the um, capacity of the state. Our next question will come from Joe uh, from Delaware Public Media. Good afternoon, Governor. Can you hear me? Yes, Joe. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that the state can do to encourage people to get vaxxed or to get their boosters? Yeah, what we're doing with <clears throat> with this press conference, getting the word out that uh, we have a surge going on. I think uh, it's been a consistent message. Uh, when the winter months come, people are indoors, they're closer together, uh, need to be more vigilant than wearing masks, staying out of uh, crowded places, and and importantly, get get vaccinated. Uh, we do. There are uh, re requirements to get vaccinated for state employees. You have to prove vaccination status or get tested. Same is true in, uh, among other employers. You know, I, I think we found that kind of the best way to do it is try to meet people with where they are and, and give them a little bit of a nudge with that kind of re uh, requirement, uh, not a rigid requirement, but one uh, that has some flexibility as opposed to you know, just with a strict uh, mandate. There's a, a lot of difference of opinion, I guess, out there on that in other jurisdictions. That's the way we're trying to do it here in Delaware. If, Governor, I, if I can add to that, um, I think one important piece of this is to um, guide people to um, carefully look at the information they're receiving. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and we know that it's impacting people's perspective. So we... Um, we really want to make sure that when people have fears or concerns about the vaccine and the side effects, that they go to credible websites or talk to credible health professionals uh, like their primary care physician or, or specialists um, to get um, good information. Because again, there's a lot of misinformation out there that's really swaying people. And uh, we hope that people will um, really look at um, the real science as they make their decisions. With holiday gatherings coming up and the low number of children uh, being vaccinated, is that in any way could affect the mask mandate at schools? I know the decision's coming up in February, but uh, could, could that be extended beyond that because of this? Well, again, we, we hope that we're in a position uh, where we can make a decision at that time in a positive way. Um, you know, I, I, we, I asked that the, the hospitalization graph uh, continue to be displayed there on the screen. I hope you can continue to see it so people can really visualize the surge that we're seeing now. Hopefully we can get over this little spike and continue to push down. We know that it's going to be harder because it's it's indoors, but I certainly want to get to the place. And by the way, you know, I've been into uh, more schools more recently. And uh, as I tell people all the time, the children don't seem to be 
trouble at all. In fact, they, a lot of them have a lot of fun uh, with their mask. I see a lot of school children that work to Warner Elementary right down the street from where I live. And they're actually wearing their mask as they're walking uh, down the street, uh, not just when they're inside uh, the building. So that's a decision that, that we'll make. Again, it's it's really an exercise in trying to, to get people to do uh, something voluntarily that's uh, good for all of us and that protects others, protects themselves. And we know that wearing a mask is is the, the most important. It's really a pretty simple thing. Uh, unfortunately, it's become you know, political gesture in some cases, or, you know, uh, a point of, uh, you know, just expressing some opposition to some of the, the decisions that we've had to make. It's really simply just keeping others safe and, and pushing down uh, that surge that we're seeing on the screen and that we saw last, last winter. We've got vaccines, we've got uh, availability in the, uh, of masks and mask wearing, and we know that they both work. Let's just do them and and protect our economy, protect jobs. I was in a small business owner's business yesterday, and you know he's uh, he struggled. He's he's used some of the assistance. In some ways, they've had a surge. Now they're having difficulty getting some product, and and you know we just need to be in a position where uh, where our economy can return to a normal state. Uh, and there are lots affecting that people. Uh, labor not being available and, and all of that. And we just, uh, so getting people to, to do these things voluntarily, I think is the best way to do it. Our next question comes from Tiana Sermons from Light Screen in Action. Hello, I'm Tiana Sermons. And yes, I'm a youth reporter in Delaware and my show is Light Screen Action. And my question is, so a lot of times when I'm telling my classmates, I actually am fully vaccinated now, um, as in this past Saturday. And I told them about my experience getting it. And a lot of them were saying how they were scared to get it or they didn't know what would happen afterwards from different stories that they would hear. So what advice would you have for them on some of the positive or benefits of actually going to get the vaccine? Well, first of all, thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you for your continued reporting. I think we you and I've met uh, a, a while ago. That's a great question. And frankly, your reporting can help us get the real information. Dr. Rate just uh, referred to it a minute ago. I'm gonna turn it over to, to her, but I think it really just boils down to getting the real science and the real information uh, in front of your friends and other students. Dr. Rate? Yeah, um, exactly. Um, I mean, the benefits of getting this vaccine are great. Um, it protects you and even people without uh, chronic underlying conditions, even younger individuals are um, suffering from severe consequences or long-term consequences of COVID-19. So we all should try to avoid this. Now, of course, for those who are older individuals, those with chronic underlying conditions, it's most important, most important that they get their booster, but we all should try to avoid getting this infection for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our community. Uh, so the benefits of getting vaccinated are great. It is the way out of this pandemic. Side effects of this vaccine are very few. Sore arm, might feel a little under the weather for 24 hours or so after you get the, the vaccine. But for the most part, these vaccines are well tolerated. Uh, very, very few severe side effects. Uh, but the misinformation that's out there, as I mentioned before, um, is really what's driving a lot of the fear. So there still are people out there that that believe that the vaccine will impact their fertility. That's just not true. There's not a feasible mechanism for the vaccine to impact fertility or for it to impact development of children or for pregnant women uh, that it might impact their their children. In fact, that's one of the, the biggest pieces of information that's really putting pregnant women and their children at risk. Um, 
uh, so uh, all the misinformation that it puts a microchip in your body, again, that just isn't true, but there are many people who do believe the misinformation. So, you know, we try to point people to credible websites, uh, credible information, uh, pointing people to um, their um, uh, trusted healthcare providers uh, can really make a big difference when people are on the fence. Uh, we encourage people to ask the questions that they have uh and not you know not just discuss them with others who might be having the same fears but really to talk talk to people about their concerns um but uh you know at the end of the day we believe so strongly that the pros of getting this vaccine far outweigh any negatives again which are very very few thank you you're welcome our next question will come from Tim Mastro from Delaware State News. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi, Tim. I uh, also had a question about schools. Um, just are you pleased with the amount of people who have enrolled in that voluntary um, testing program where you get tested each week? And I know, I believe there's never been a week where there's uh, been more than 500 in-person contagious cases, according to the dashboard. Are you just pleased with that um, number so far? Where, just, where do you think um, the state is at so far with, with schools? Yeah, I think we've had our experience in schools has, has been good in terms of the number of cases. I think the most important thing, Tim, is that we haven't seen spread in schools. And I'll turn over to Dr. Rate to, to talk about that. But I think that's the biggest fear and the biggest challenge and the biggest reason, rationale, uh, to continue to have our uh, students wearing masks while in school, because we know they're in very close contact to one another. Um, and, but schools are highly regulated environments, you know, in the classrooms. They have some, you know, movement from classroom to classroom and lunch, uh, the lunchroom and that kind of thing that are, aren't as rigidly uh, regulated as, you know, kind of the other times and spaces. but. So far, I think it's been a really good experience. Um, you know, we'd like to see more, more of the younger people vaccinated. That's been going uh, uh, slower, I think, than we'd, we'd like. Uh, but in terms of the, the case, we've seen very little uh, spread in, in schools. Dr. Rate, would you? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. I, I mean, I think we're really um, very pleased with how everything has gone um, with schools this year. We know it's been stressful for uh, for for everyone involved, especially our amazing school nurses in 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 Delaware. Um, but we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our highest case rates for the last few months have been among that school age population. But we've seen almost no spread in schools. As the governor said, we really do attribute that to mask wearing in schools. So we know that that is, that is making a difference. We also, though, we do know that testing, specifically testing of unvaccinated individuals, um, can make a huge difference. You know, although people seem to be getting, uh, the kids may be coming positive at home or other, other gatherings, other settings, um, this school testing can really help identify uh, those who are positive to prevent the spread. And we do think that that is helping. We'd love to see enrollment higher in the testing program, but we really are pleased how it has been going so far. And I have to, have to add, as the governor did too, um, the more and more kids that get vaccinated, uh, the less testing that will be needed in schools. Mm -hmm. Right. And Governor, you kind of mentioned how the uh, wearing a mask uh, or not wearing a mask has almost become a political statement. Do you also feel that way with some people refusing the vaccine? Has that provided any difficulty with vaccination rates in any specific areas? And is there anything you can do to bridge that gap when you have a situation like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to say there is some correlation between, you know, the objection to mask wearing and, and the things that we're doing more generally, uh, kind of from a political perspective and vaccination rates. Although the, the 
uh, the demographic, both you know, all over the state, that has the lowest vaccination rates. Uh, we can put that uh, slide up for you if you'd like to see it again. Is is that young adult, like eighteen to thirty five year olds? You know, they hover around fifty percent or lower. Uh, and uh, that's not the one. The one with all the sub age groups. There you go. Um, they're lower in in Kent and Sussex County. Um, and I think, you know, so, you know, part of it is kind of addressing uh, the concerns where they are. I mean, if it's, if it's going to be uh, some kind of statement uh, or not, that's going to be hard to deal with. But if we can get to some of these misconceptions, some of these myths around uh, vaccination uh, and its effects. But overall, um, you know, you, you, our vaccination rates are are pretty high. They're higher the older you get. Maybe those of us who are older understand our vulnerability. Um, and, you know, I, I was a young adult at one point in time, too, and nobody likes to be told what to do. And, and you know, we feel like we're in, invincible. I think that's part of it. And so I think that's, you know, the psychology of it is it's interesting. And, and I think our challenge is to figure out the best way to, to get people to the point of saying, yeah, I'm going to get I'm going to get a, get a shot, protect myself, and protect uh, loved ones around me. Our last question comes from DJ from WDEL. I don't know, DJ. You might be muted. My apologies. Uh, you'd think I'd be used to this by this point. Um, <laughs> you've seen the the surge last winter and the new fears and variants uh, th that are causing cases to rise already this year. Um, do you have an anticipation for what this year will look like? Do you expect it? And and I know Dr. Rite, we we talked a little bit about the Omicron variant. I think a couple of weeks ago. Uh, do you have an anticipation for how that will impact uh, this year's rise in cases? Uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Rite uh, address that, but uh, if, if again, if we can look at the the hospitalization graph again and show, yeah, that surge. You know, I was hoping that that September surge, that little bump that you see there, and we started to to go down more gradually uh, than last uh, December, January, that we would continue to go down. And now that we've seen it as we've gotten into December and. It, somewhat predictable, I guess, after the Thanksgiving holidays and we're trending the wrong direction. You know, I would have hoped that we were, uh, uh, we were, would continue to, to head down, uh, but it's, I think it's hard to predict. I can tell you what, what I'd like to see happen, which is that uh, the peak right there where we are at 296 and start going down the other way. Dr. Rite, why don't you, put a, a scientific uh, analysis of that question? Well, there's a couple points. Um, one is we're going to struggle to get out of this pandemic if we don't get more people vaccinated, fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, we know this. And while we've made great progress with vaccination, I mean, it's it's worth celebrating the fact that our death rate has slowed so significantly c compared to last year. Um, but being able to stop these hospitalizations and um, really um, getting us out of the pandemic surges that were the roller coaster that we're in, as the governor described, um, is going to require more people getting fully vaccinated and more people getting boosted. As far as Omicron goes, um, there just are a lot of unknowns still, and I don't want to get ahead of the science. Um, you know, again, we just don't know how transmissible this will will be, how severe this will be, how effective the vaccine will be. But we do believe that the current vaccinations will do a lot to be able to prevent um, especially hospitalization and death um, when we begin to see spread of Omicron here in our state. So again, lots of unknowns, but that is um, a point that many 
in the field are very confident of. So the bottom line is the more and more people that can get fully vaccinated and boosted, uh, the more quickly we're gonna be able to really get ourselves out of this pandemic. So I think that yep. was the last question, unless you had another one, DJ. Um, I, I did, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Dr. Tay, would it be fair to say that getting vaccinated removes some of the avenue for variants to find a way to evolve and and not to beat a dead horse but a, a point that you've mentioned a couple of times now is uh as, and governor convincing people who have read and believe misinformation to to get vaccinated is there a portion of the population that you simply write off because i see some of the comments that we get on stories when we cover this and some of the things that people say are are outrageous how do you convince people that public health experts are not trying to put microchips in them. Yeah, um, and I think um, for, to your first point, it's a really good question. Um, the virus finds a foothold in unvaccinated populations. And if you look at Omicron in South Africa, um, many unvaccinated individuals, so the more the virus spreads, the more opportunity for mutations there are. And so, you know, that's a key piece of why more people need to get vaccinated for us to get out of this uh, pandemic situation we're in, because we are going to continue to see mutations uh, and potentially serious mutations of, um, of this variant, of this virus, um, if it continues to have so many opportunities to spread. So getting more people vaccinated will help decrease future mutations of this virus. Yeah, DJ, I mean, I think you've, uh, if you've put your finger on really our biggest challenge, right? Which is to, to get people that, you know, are acting with misinformation, uh, really bad uh, information. In some, some cases, you know, it's, it's just a, maybe an excuse to, to not to do what, what's being uh, recommended, but that, you know, that's our challenge and we can't give up, you know, we've got to continue to try to find a way uh, to get people to, to kind of do the right thing. Sometimes it works by showing the, the, uh, the surge that's, that we're seeing there, but sometimes it works by, you know, it has to work. I know that, that I've had friends that were resisting getting vaccinated and then it really impacted uh, because somebody close tested positive and then their son or daughter couldn't participate in a particular sporting event, or maybe it's somebody who, uh, who's, who you're close to, who you've seen has passed away. You know, we're just going to have to continue to lean in and try to find the way, meet people where they are, get them to do the right thing so we can get out of this and, and prevent uh, and you know limit elimit uh, the foothold that that virus and the variants uh, find and, and uh, to create uh, surges uh, down the road. I think that's our challenge. We'll we'll continue to be at it. Uh, you know we've we've made progress through each of these surges, and this one looks a little bit different. Uh, it is similar in the sense that these are the winter months. Uh, these are celebrations. People tend to let, let their guard down a little bit. That's why we wanted to get out and, and share the information, make sure everybody's paying attention to where the positivity rates are, where the, uh, the number of new cases are, where the hospitalization uh, rates are. Uh, one of the really good things, one of the positive things Dr. Rate said, and, and I think a lot of it is because our vaccination rates are, are high, is that the the fatalities have uh, rates have, have uh, slowed considerably. Sadly, though, still 2,203 Delawareans have uh, succumbed to COVID-19. That's a very sad thing for them and their families and friends, and that's something we want to avoid for all Delawareans, and we want to avoid another surge that that seems to be on the offing here as we look at the data uh, for December uh, 7th. And I guess it, it's really appropriate uh, to recognize as we close out the 80th anniversary of, of Pearl Harbor, so many Americans who uh, gave their lives and sacrificed during 80 years ago uh, during World War II, the greatest 
generation and generation. I don't know that we'll ever see again a generation that came up during the depression and and served during the war and, and the aftermath of that. And you think about the sacrifices that the, they made, the, the things that we're asking our citizens to do now in terms of wearing a mask and getting vaccinated are, are just de minimis uh, by comparison. And so let's all be patriotic. Let's support our city and our state uh, and our country. Get vaccinated, get boosted, uh, protect your neighbors by wearing a mask when, when you're in an indoor crowded place. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next time.